without further ado, uh, Carl Gross, the speaker of the topic, priority, Prioritizing Remediation of Accessibility Issues. Carl Gross. Thanks, Mike. I'm actually going to uh, mute my speakers <clears throat> uh, so I don't cause feedback. Uh, so if there's any questions, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat. And uh, this is the saga of my terrible microphone issues. I actually went out today and uh, ran out to get the best possible microphone that I could. And the guy Best Buy was like, yeah, you should totally get these gamer headphone microphone things. These are great. Uh, and it turns out uh, they don't work on computers. Uh, I still have it running as Bluetooth. Hopefully it sounds good. And I'd like to just dive right in right now with, uh, this is actually one of my, my favorite topics. So <clears throat> really quickly about me, uh, Mike's already introduced me. Um, my email there though is kgroves at Pos Yellow Group. You can follow me on Twitter at Carl Groves <clears throat> and uh, my phone number's there as well. That's actually a picture of me, by the way. And uh, as many of you may not know, I, I used to be a rock star. I used to sing for a band in the 90s called the Spin Doctors. I'm actually kidding, uh, but that is me. And uh, that was in my younger, trimmer, less hairy days. So <clears throat> first off, I want to start off by setting the stage here. And I want to talk about what is an accessibility issue. Um, we need to move away from this idea <clears throat> that um, that accessibility issues that are something separate from any other issues that are out there. Accessibility issues are not nice to haves. They're not enhancements. You know, when we log these things in our issue tracking system, it's not an enhancement. It's not like a new story. It's a bug. Uh, we've created a flaw in our system, which harms the ability uh, for the system to be used effectively by users. Okay, so it would be as if a feature in the system didn't work. Um, and so it's really important for us to, to get that idea of an enhancement or a nice to have out of the way. If it's a problem, if it's an accessibility issue, it's a bug, we need to address it as such in our standard issue tracking uh, methodologies. Now, why do we need to prioritize <clears throat> accessibility issues? Well, just like any other issue, it's because we didn't get it right in the first time. Okay. And so now, just like any other bug, we need to uh, allocate the resources to do so. Uh, now, <clears throat> this uh, picture that I have on here actually shows uh, why this is important. Um, <clears throat> it, ideally, we want to avoid the bug in the first place, right? Because now, uh, now we have actual money and actual resources that need to be dedicated to fixing these things. And I have a little formula on here. It allows us to calculate the cost per defect of fixing issues. Really simply, it's the number of people times the number of app, times the number of hours necessary to fix it times the number of or divided by the number of defects, and that number is multiplied by the cost per person per hour. Uh, and this is a this is really important to keep in mind that as we are as we are fixing issues, we are spending money. It's uh, whether it's actual money or it's or it's money paid out in, in terms of salary and and the fully loaded uh, cost for that for that specific human resource. Uh, when they're fixing bugs, they're doing something completely differently than uh, than the level of effort necessary in actually um, uh, creating new features and making improvements to the system. So we need to uh, apply these resources as effectively as we possibly can. Now, as Mike mentioned in the introduction, uh, I've been doing accessibility consulting and, and web development and usability consulting for over a decade now. I've performed scores of audits and expert reviews to look at the usability and accessibility of web-based systems. And often I can count on one hand the number of systems that I tested that were in pre-production phase. They were prior to that, that uh, they weren't deployed. Um, when I got there to do the usability study or when we got there to do the audit. So many times the testing is going to be performed on the systems that were already released to users. And in this scenario, an organization's level of risk is at its highest. People are actually using the system at that point and therefore the organization and its developers 
are going to require sufficiently informative data uh, from their accessibility testing that's detailed, clear, and most importantly, actionable. Okay, uh, it doesn't really do us any good to throw them a report that's filled with a bunch of accessibility uh, that, uh, violations unless that report also includes information to help them actually fix their problems. They need to know what their problems are, where their problems are, and how to fix them. So there's also an additional item to, that they need to know when to fix them. So uh, as we do our accessibility audits and we, we, we at the Paseo group, we turn them over to the client, they're going to they're almost universally ask us the same question: What do we fix now? Right. So this is going to help us uh, apply our resources most effectively. Post-deployment bug fixes are needlessly expensive. If we can get ahead of them, um, we should. But obviously, as I said, we get to the we get into this testing phase after the fact, and now we need to apply our resources in a manner that's going to reach the reach the deepest uh, towards the greater good. So prioritizing re remediation is going to help accessibility. Uh, uh, m minimize the accessibility's impact on the business, right? So for those of you who are uh, who've ever worked for a large organization, um, uh, trying to fight for budget uh, is a is a big deal that a lot of uh, a lot of people face. And so then um, we're now we have these bugs. We're gonna we're gonna sort of throw them over the fence. And now uh, accessibility is is going to be an impact on the business. Can you shut that dog up, please? I clicked the unmute button and it clips itself. So that was just the, uh, the, the that was the smoke break section of the presentation. So uh, so so we need to understand what what risk is. Risk is the potential that a chosen action or activity, including including uh, the choice of inaction, is going to lead to a loss. And and a loss could be any sort of uh, undesirable outcome for the organization. And so ultimately, remediation is going to be uh, a risk mitigation strategy. Now, uh, I really don't like the idea of, of, uh, of selling accessibility um, by fear. And so what I don't want to do is characterize risk as, as like we're going to get law, we're going to get sued. Uh, that's obviously a real risk. That risk <clears throat> is uh, based on a number of factors that, that I, I'm going to discuss a little bit later. <clears throat> but basically, um, there's a, there are many types of risks that are created by bugs in a system. Uh, the first risk, of course, is poor quality. Uh, and that what I mean here is the, the, um, a problem in the operability or performance uh, of the system for the end user. Okay? Uh, this could possibly lead to lost income. Uh, the volume or severity of the bugs is such that uh, users who want to buy our products or consume our content uh, do not or cannot do so, and then we lose money. That's a real risk, too. We also have uh, ancillary losses. Uh, this would be losses caused by spending money then when you don't need to. And what I mean here is primarily accessibility issues that have, have to be fixed after the fact. Uh, oops. <laughs> we decided accessibility is important, and now we got to spend money we didn't need to spend. And that negatively impacts the money we have available to do other things, uh, to add new features, or to who knows even even market some of the new features uh, on our website. Um, 
you know, lots of people <clears throat> talk about the, the uh, you know, your online application couldn't be easier for car insurance. And then next thing you know, you have to go through and fix it. And that's going to, and that's going to hinder other possible new features of the, of the, uh, of the uh, system uh, that we're creating. And that, and that's a big deal. Like I said, you know, uh, uh, human effort actually costs money. Uh, those humans doing anything other than developing new work is money that's, uh, that's in my opinion, lost. And then finally, yes, uh, this also, uh, the, the risk exists for certain organizations that, uh, that we could have uh, an, an administrative complaint or, or litigation. So uh, in, in terms of administrative complaint, what I'm really talking about here in the United States is a <clears throat> formal complaint uh, against uh, uh, Section 5 of the Rehabilitation Act or ADA depending on the type of uh, entity, entity you are. Um, th these are real, actual, set in stone legal requirements. Uh, and the non-compliance with those legal requirements is going to raise the chance that we can have a heavy hand of regu regulators uh, breathing down our necks. Even, even the threat of these sorts of things uh, can be, can be a, a, a risk, because at that point, basically, um, <clears throat> what ends up happening is an organization will will flood a project or uh, flood the uh, development team with uh, with uh, a, a diversion of work into uh, re repairing accessibility stuff rather than um, rather than doing other things. It can be extremely disruptive in terms of uh, of the workflow, and so you know the the threat of litigation there is uh, is 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 very possible depending on where you are in your industry. I've done a lot of research on this myself. I have a, on my on my blog. I have a list of accessibility lawsuits and settlements, and uh, I haven't updated it in a, in a while. But uh, last I checked, I think it was uh, 41, 44. Those two numbers stick out. Uh, and if you are basically the largest uh, in your in your industry, and you exist in finance and insurance. Um, uh, online retail, travel, education, government services, stuff like that, your risk is really high. Uh, almost all of those 41, 45, whatever um, uh, uh, lawsuits uh, have happened in those things. So it's a big deal. And uh, Elle Waters, a former coworker of mine, ha said it best, I think, when, when uh, she was talking to someone and, and her and um, they were talking about risk, and, and Elle's statement was really insightful. She said, Do you, would you rather spend your money on your timeline or on someone else's timeline? Um, and that's a big deal because, because uh, what will happen in these situations when you, when you deal with a complaint like that is now your ability to uh, steer your own budget, steer your own project timeline goes from, from being in your hands to being in someone else's hands, and, and that's that's definitely a, a problem nobody really wants to have. So hopefully this will go towards answering Jonathan's questions. Um, so the so when we're talking about risk, we also have to take into consideration this idea of probability. Uh, and my my picture here uh, uh, on the slide is is a, a good one uh, for myself as an ex smoker and and family members who smoke and got lung disease um, because your probability is the number of negative events divided by population. And what we mean here is, in this case, what is your probability of an actualized risk? So in its simplest form, probability equals the number of negative events divided by population. So your probability of anything happening is based on the size of your population and the number of negative events within that population. But we're not talking about uh, we're not talking about the uh, uh, the direct population of all people or all websites. So in other words, if 10 people out of every 100 get a speeding ticket every five years, then your probability of getting a speeding ticket every five years is 10 percent. 10 divided by 100 is 0.10, 10, uh, so it's 10 percent. Uh, so in terms of accessibility lawsuits or or other negative events. Uh, it's important to understand how to determine your population. Your, your population isn't all the other sites on the web. So 
for instance, uh, in, in the case of this, this woman smoking on the slide, um, my risk or my wife's risk of getting lung cancer is not the same um, because of the fact that we don't smoke anymore. Um, so our population is our peer companies. Now, how do you define your peer companies involves a number of factors such as your industry, site features, the number of dogs in your house, um, and hold on. Uh, and so, um, so uh, the the audience demographics, the reach, and the engagement and risky behavior. So when I say peer, I'm not really saying competition because your competition could be a brick and mortar entity, or it could be a company that's much smaller. Uh, and so while they compete in the marketplace, they're not a peer. Uh, again, to use a simple analogy, lung cancer probability equals the number of cancer cases divided by the number of people engaging in cancer-causing behaviors. All right. Uh, so although everyone has some level of probability for lung cancer, people who are engaging in, lung, in the cancer-causing behaviors in a very different peer group. Uh, so in the case of, of Jonathan's question, um, it, it, the uh, I would say that the prior lawsuits in higher education have been oriented towards really big higher education institutions, uh, Penn State, and I think another one, another one was the CSU um, system, not just a single CSU campus, but the entire system. So we're talking about really big. Um, the ADA is is uh, is very concerned, or not the ADA specific, the DOJ is uh, very interested in higher education these days, especially in the case of um, uh, online learning, uh, because online learning offers a, a really uh, an unprecedented level of access to learning for people with disabilities um, that didn't really exist before. Um, so uh, it's, gonna ha it's gonna tend to be uh, a, a, a bigger deal, I think, in the future. Uh, I wonder what Mike has to say about that before I move on to to our risk amount. Right. So let's. Uh, Mike's comment here is uh, that MOOCs uh, make the, the entire EDU market an open target. And that's really, I think that's going to be uh, a growing area of, of accessibility lawsuits um, these, uh, in the future. All right. So now. Let's talk about our risk amount. So a risk amount basically is the, uh, I'm sorry guys. Uh, the joys of working from home with uh, construction across the street. Okay, so uh, so the, from from the probability we can determine how much we're risking. Okay, our risk amount is our probability multiplied by our expected loss. So our risk amount equals the probability of a negative event times our expected loss in the in the case of a, a negative event. So, for example, if we have a 10% probability, our risk amount is 10% of the total expected loss. So it's gonna be 0 0.10 times total expected loss. So to use an extreme case, we we'll use the target lawsuit. So uh, the, the, uh, in the target lawsuit, target settled with the NFB for 6 million uh, plus 40 million in attorney's fees. And then I think they pledged a certain amount each year for some sort of, uh, um, uh, some sort of uh, 
uh, uh, annual thing for uh, contributions to a, a nonprofit. Anyway, let, we'll just call it ten million dollars to, to keep a round number. So based on their population, which is in this case very large e-commerce sites, they had an eight percent probability. So 0 0.08 times ten million equals eight hundred thousand dollars. So if you're a company that's a peer of Target, your level of risk is eight hundred thousand dollars. Uh, some people are going to argue that you're actually risking $10 million because that's what targets settle for, but that doesn't take into consideration the probability uh, of the lawsuit. So from this, I think we can derive an accessibility ROI. So your return on investment for accessibility work, assuming uh, you fit into that 8% probability, is $800,000 minus the money you spend on fixing or remediating these accessibility related bugs. So for those of you who may be interested in trying to sell accessibility internally, it may make sense to take this into consideration when trying to gather budget for the efforts is how much do we stand to lose if we don't do it? How much do we plan on spending? And as long as you uh, uh, save more than, than your expected loss, but a bing, you have ROI. Now, Mike actually talked about this in his first uh, in his presentation, which was the first of the uh, uh, the ID24, where he was talking about loss of sales uh, as the RO as the risk amount. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a lawsuit. Uh, in Mike's case, he was talking about a loss of sales for people uh, who had they had calculated their um, their uh, expected amount of purchase per user, their, their um, anticipated amount of uh, income per user who makes a purchase. And Mike had said, you know, these are, this is the, this is the uh, number of people who you may be losing. And so that's their, that was their risk amount, was a loss of sales. So it doesn't have to be a lawsuit. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, I think we can make this argument without trying to scare people with the, the specter of, uh, the heavy hand of, of justice. So now let's talk about our challenges in, in uh, <clears throat> trying to fix the system. I, I love this picture. I try to squeeze it into every slide uh, slide deck I make, which is uh, it's an it's a <laughs> it's a road construction project, or at least it looks like one, where you, you can't turn left, you can't turn right, you can't go forward, you can't go backwards, uh, and there's uh, traffic cans in front of the way. The one road on the left is uh, says road closed and wrong way, do not enter. So it really looks like you can't go anywhere from here. Uh, so let's talk about trying to change that a little bit. A uh, couple of things to keep in mind, and that is <clears throat> the, the first one I think is not all accessibility problems are equal. And this is a this is sort of a, a problem that we have when we when we turn over that uh, big report that we give to our clients is it, it you know it, uh, our reports often tend to have what, what I call a lot of plot factor and the plot factor is uh, is a, a term that I actually got from a prior boss and that is the sound that the report makes when it hits the table uh, the, the amount of plot the, the sound that it makes the plop sound it makes when it hits the desk that's the, the plot factor of the of report so here we have this big report we ship over it to the client and they go, oh man, this is going to be a lot of work. And that's not, uh, it, it, well, yes, there probably is a lot of work to be done because we're really good at finding problems, but not all of them are equal. They're not equal for a number of reasons. Um, uh, there, there, there are going to be differences in terms of time uh, that it takes to, to, do the, the, to do the work, uh, the impact on the end users, um, the impact on the business. Uh, these are all uh, really important considerations, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of guidance in terms of how to to take uh, to fix those things. And so, if you're relatively new to accessibility, maybe you've uh, tossed your pages through a couple of online uh, free online checkers, or maybe even purchased an online tool for accessibility. You got this huge report, and you've got to figure out what to deal with and uh, a lot of people look towards the, the WCAG level and the WCAG success criteria as, um, as their guidance for, uh, for determining pri priority. Some of that actually stems from uh, 
people believing that WCAG 2.0's level is uh, synonymous with WCAG 1.0's priority. Um, what, what happened in 1.0 was that, uh, that the, the word priority uh, didn't really take into consideration any other factors other than user impact. So they, they said that, you know, priority one things were really important, you had to do them, and so on and so forth. Uh, they were, those things were entirely t uh, <clears throat> uh, gauged based on the impact of the user, and that's valuable. Uh, but unfortunately for, for a business to allocate resources, they need to know a little bit more than that. And, uh, and I think that the WCAG working group uh, in creating WCAG level uh, did a good thing uh, by creating a level uh, which is very, uh, the, the terminology uh, is, is different, which is uh, more than symbolic, but it also, uh, you can see in the archives of, of uh, some of the discussions there and even some of the, uh, some of the early working drafts you can see that they talked a little bit about um, about these these factors that I have listed here, uh, and unfortunately, none of that stuff made it into the um, made it into the the final uh, published recommendation. Uh, so I think they've sort of left us high and dry in, in in any sort of discussion about what level is. But keeping in mind that level really really is not appropriate in my opinion. Uh, for discussing that. So let, I want to give you uh, my own idea here for what these things can be. Uh, so so WCAG level A uh, are going to be things that are, uh, uh, that are very, uh, very important, have a really high impact on the user, and are typically very easy to impact, uh, implement without impacting the business logic or the presentation logic of the system. So WCAG level A is where you see stuff like alt text for images, right? So it's super easy to just add alt text for, for image. Uh, it's not going to impact the presentation of anything, and, uh, and you're good to go. And it's got a huge impact for the user. Same thing goes for stuff like form labels. It's, that's a level, uh, level A thing. Uh, level double A are things that that are also uh, as important, um, but may have an impact on the presentation logic or the business logic. And this is why, unfortunately, uh, color contrast is listed as a double A thing. It's double A because of the fact that it may actually impact the the, the site itself. That if we come up with branded colors, you know, for all of our marketing material, and now we have to go ahead and um, and uh, 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 redesign our site to, to meet color contrast stuff. That, that might mean that it's going to alter our branding a little bit. People are not also not not very um, not very uh, pleased by that idea. And then AAA things are things that are um, often going to be uh, technically or logistically infeasible. Things like real-time captioning for live video um, or real or, or things like real-time uh, audio description. Uh, currently there's no uh, open source player available that even does audio description in the first first place, much less offers the ability for someone to stream uh, audio description in, into them. So again that's a, that's a big deal. So what I did was I decided to take my own list of best practices and sort them by impact. And I gave an impact of one for each user population affected. And I carved that out into low vision, blind, hearing impaired, uh, mobility impaired, and cognitive. In other words, uh, violating a best practice that impacts all of them got a five for impact. Violating a best practice that only impact one population, like, like blind people, got a one. And what I found was, um, that uh, <clears throat> that uh, based solely on uh, solely on user impact, 33% of those were AAA, uh, and um, uh, the ones that got four, there were 30 of those that were A's, 10 that were triple A's, and 50, or 10 that were double A's, and 15 that were triple A's. So uh, four user impact populations existed. 
uh, that were in uh, uh, 27% of those were, were AAA. So clearly, uh, user impact isn't the only thing that we should be consider. We should be considered. Um, so uh, obviously, not all best practices are going to be created equally. You know, provi providing a, a help link on each page, which is uh, mapped to WCAG 3.3.5, is definitely not the same as provide the ability to pause, stop, or hide content that updates automatically, which is 2.2.2, or provide the ability for users to turn on sound only at their request, which is 1.4.2. The latter case here just illustrates the need to rank the impact of individual populations. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the impact of auto-starting audio for blind people is huge, right? I mean, when you have auto-starting audio, uh, that's going to that's gonna hinder the user's ability to do anything effectively on that page, right? Um, but the impact on a mobility impaired person and, and a, uh, a low vision person is going to be much higher than someone who's hearing impaired or cognitively impaired. Um, so these are the kind of things that need to be taken into consideration. Um, so let's talk really quickly at time, right? So time is often at a premium. Uh, doing bug remediation takes time, and this is ideally time that we do not want to spend because we, we should be getting everything right in the first place. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So creating bugs is going to cause us to incur technical debt. So for those who don't know what technical debt is, it's a metaphor referring to the eventual consequences of poor design. We always have to pay our technical debt in some form. That's going to be either uh, the time to repair those bugs or uh, we may have to repay that technical debt other ways, like supporting users in different fashions, uh, uh, telling people to call our help desk. That, that, that's not the, you know, that's not really a good mitigation because you're still uh, incurring technical debt, right? So repair of bugs is, uh, is a time expense and time is money. So we need to ensure that we prioritize on the important things that so that effort is not used frivolously, that we don't spend a lot of time with a uh, relatively low level of impact. Uh, the next thing we need to take into consideration is, is uh, the, the uh, impact on other things, uh, time, uh, uh, on our budget, on our resources, and our system. So bug repair is always going to cause an impact on the budgets, resources, and to the system. Do these bugs cause us to require outside help from a consultant? Do we need to outsource this repair to a third party? Do we need to take that work away from a third party um, because they've proven themselves unqualified, right? And we see that a lot, actually. Uh, I was on a big project where work had to be shifted away from a team, uh, an outsourced development team that was not capable of creating an accessible UI. Uh, they just, they, that skill set didn't exist. Um, and how is this? Fixing this bug going to impact the actual system? Is it going to impact our presentation logic? Is it going to impact our business logic? Uh, this is especially true for systems that are not using uh, MVC, that, that systems that have their business logic and presentation logic intrinsically tied together. Um, uh, are there other features in the system or in upcoming builds that are going, that are going to be impacted by fixing this? These are all really important uh, factors to, to consider. So let's talk about a couple of remediation approaches. The first one I'm going to talk about is, is simple remediation, right? Uh, by the way, um, this is, I love this picture. Um, uh, this is a picture from, from a par three golf course that I go to. Uh, and this is, for those who can't see it, th this is a, this is their version of an accessible ramp. <laughs> The stairs here, uh, I mean, I, I swear, this must be, I don't know, 45 degrees. If you took a wheelchair down it, it would probably be really, really fun, uh, and you're never going get to get, get it up there. So uh, so I, I chose this one for our simple remediation because, really, this is going uh, to be a simple idea. Um, uh, we're going to focus solely on time and simple impact. How long is this going to take, and how bad is this problem? Right. That's how we're going to measure uh, measure this this approach, and, and from that, uh, we're going to figure out what's going to get get uh, the first. Um, 
So the pros here, it's focused on the user, right? It's super simple to understand how big of a deal it is and, uh, and uh, so on. It's super simple to understand. And often the hunch uh, from an expert is, is often as good as something more formal. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't take into consideration things like impact on the business or impact on the system. Uh, again, you can say, oh man, that's gonna be a huge deal. Uh, but there's no actual sort of formal uh, uh, formal uh, methodology behind it. So some, some ideas I've come up with on advanced prioritization, I'm going to have six things to put into consideration. Uh, as before, we're going to consider user impact and, and ease and speed of repair. But <clears throat> when we talk about, other, we're going to talk about some other things, impact on the system. So how... How's this going to change the interface? Uh, will it cause any impact to our business logic? Um, another thing to consider is volume. How often does this specific issue uh, exist in the, in the system? Uh, where is it? Where is the problem? You know, uh, let's face it. Nobody actually goes to about me pages or about us pages or whatever. Um, so so if, that, if that's where the issue exists, uh, that's going to be a lower priority than something on the home page, right? So we know uh, from our analytics, our home page gets the, gets the highest amount of traffic, so on and so forth. And then, hey, um, let's talk about secondary benefit, right? So can we get any additional business boost by fixing this? Uh, and in all six cases, I'm going to rank these based on, based on four scores. Each item is going to be ranked none, low, medium, or high. None, uh, that's a zero. In other words, either it's a not a consideration or there's no weight given uh, by this consideration. Uh, low, in other words, the weight for this factor is low compared to the other things. Uh, medium, and then high. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of weight in this case. And each of these factors gets considered along the way. Another thing I did is uh, I want to I measure the impact on users broken down by the user type. So remember, uh, you know, things like name, state, role, and value are going to impact people, uh, that impact more than just one user population. It's going to impact um, those user populations uh, differently, though, right? So, uh, so here what I did was... Uh, impact itself is uh, basically a, the, the simple sum of the impact on uh, different user populations, blind, visually impaired, um, hard of hearing, motor, cognitive, and speech. And each of those are going to have uh, the, um, <clears throat> each of those are going to have the, uh, the same uh, zero to, to three uh, considerations. Um, given to them. I chose zero to three, by the way. Um, I, I, I've seen other people talk about one to ten on something like that, and, and I think the problem there is is one of math, uh, because when I tried to do this with, with one to ten, the problem was that it wasn't, it wasn't apparent when you actually ran it in the real world which ones should get, um, get the highest prioritization. So when I reduced this to zero to three, that's when I saw actual statistical significance on some test runs that I ran. All right, so uh, so ease and speed of repair. How long is it going to take? How difficult is it to fix? So my, my picture here is of a <laughs> of a of a steel pole in front of a an accessible ramp, and obviously this is super easy to figure out, right? How long is it going to take, and how difficult is it? Just take those four bolts out and we're good to go, right? Uh, and then, uh, whoops, impact on the interface. So how will this alter our presentation logic or our business logic, right? Uh, there's going to be times when an accessibility-related re repair may be necessary, which would have a negative impact on the user interface uh, or, or the operation of the interface as it's designed. So. One, often, one area I see this a lot is uh, in color contrast of the primary site templates. And um, <clears throat> in these cases, poor color contrast is going to be used, which is related to our branding. And improving the color contrast is essentially going to require a redesign of the site and possibly even the branding. So, wow. Uh, 
So in this scenario, things that require significant redesign need to be given a lower uh, precedence over things that will have little to no uh, impact on the interface. The next one is volume of repeat issues. <clears throat> the first thing to consider here is how many times did this exact issue occur? Uh, when uh, This is especially important in things like automated testing, right? Because if we, let's say we run a scan with some tool and it finds this same issue, you know, 10,000 times using the same exact code, uh, we know that that's going to have a very quick uh, repair and it's going to have a huge impact because it's probably in the template, right? Uh, an example I used to use often was uh, was in the case of uh, like a, like the CNN homepage uh, on the search field. Let's say that search field there didn't have a form label. Um, that's going to be a big deal. It's going to exist everywhere on that CNN page. Let's fix that baby once. We're going to get a huge, huge benefit from that, right? People are going to be more effective at searching. Uh, and, but also, how many times do similar issues occur, right? So do we have problems on all of our form fields or all of our forms where form fields are, are missing labels? I, I'm doing an audit right now of a system where their text inputs have great labels. All their text inputs, uh, their text areas, their, uh, their select elements, all those are great. Uh, it so happens that whatever framework they use or for, from whatever classes they have, somehow isn't effectively creating labels on radio buttons and uh, checkboxes. So we need to get them to fix that. Uh, and we're going to give that a high priority because they're very similar issues. It's not the exact one, but they're similar enough. Next one is going to be the location of the issues. Uh, quite simply, where is it, right? So <clears throat> if this is in a location that is, uh, that, that is, uh, that has high traffic and, uh, or the, the location is critical, right? So if it's a, a it, it's in a critical workflow, uh, something like registering for something or logging in. Those are those are critical workflows, right? They're they're a, a, they're a dependency in that in that uh, in that use case. Those are going to have a high uh, priority. We need to make sure that they uh, that people can succeed on that. It's probably even tied to some conversion factor, right? And uh, so that's going to be a big deal. And then finally, uh, we, we should consider secondary benefit. I don't I don't mind considering some secondary benefits when I'm when I'm thinking this stuff. Uh, the obvious ones here are you know is this going to make things a, a positive experience for users who are older or or who have uh, low literacy, maybe even people on low bandwidth. We we know that people uh, uh, in rural areas in the United States don't have uh, things like FiOS or or broadband, uh, stuff like that. There's also reduced development and maintenance time, so on and so forth. But also what about SEO benefits, right? So uh, if there are some, some SEO benefits to be had and, and you can quantify that, um, that's a big deal, right? Well, I, I remember one time uh, they, I worked with a client who said uh, every converted customer is worth about fifteen thousand dollars. Every conversion is fifteen thousand dollar conversion over the life of the account. That's a big deal. So if we can approve SEO like that, that's that's real money that we're talking about. So after that, uh, let's do it. Let's uh, weigh all these things. Uh, so our final formula here is a little bit on the cramp side. It's impact plus repair speed plus location plus secondary benefits times volume is going to equal our priority. We're going to sort by that, and then we're going to fix them accordingly. <clears throat> Pretty cool, huh? Um, <clears throat> but there's a little bit more than that. Uh, the first time I gave this, uh, first time I gave this uh, this presentation, I, I focused simply on that formula there uh, that I talked about, and uh, and some other people said, "Well, wait a minute, um, shouldn't we weigh these a little bit?" And I actually think it was. Uh, a good buddy, um, Olivier in France, who had mentioned that they were talking about some of that stuff in, in some methodology he, they were doing. And they actually published an academic paper on this, which was ironic because it was about the same time I gave this, uh, this series of blog posts and the presentation. Uh, so I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. Uh, some of these things probably should be weighed more, right? So I shouldn't give as much weight to something like my secondary benefit as I would to 
the impact on the user, right? So what I did was I grabbed a bunch of, uh, of peers out there in the Twitter sphere, uh, had them do a, a, a Delphi method, a Delphi approach. And the Delphi method, if I understand correctly, was actually first used to determine how many uh, nuclear weapons it would take to blow up the enemy. Uh, so it was a DARPA thing, and they would go through and you ask people anonymously, what do you think the answer to this question is? So I asked a bunch of people anonymously what, what I thought their weighting factor would be and, uh, on, on each of these factors, and then, uh, and then, I, uh, and then I collated the results. I, I did a second round. I said, this is what, what we have so far. Do you agree or disagree? Would you like to change your answer? So on and so forth. And... Um, and this is, uh, this is what we came up with. The user impact here is listed as 3.95, meaning that in this formula here, the, the actual formula would be much more like uh, 3.95 times whatever our determined uh, user impact would be. Uh, impact on the interface would be 1.5 times, so on and so forth. So these things bang. Uh, these get our get our weights. What has ended up happening actually is um, I've placed uh, I've placed this algorithm a, a, in the priority ranking of Tenon, and judging by the results that I've gotten from from uh, from doing some automated testing of Tenon to see its capabilities, this is uh, this has actually turned out to be a really valuable feature. So from this prioritization, now that we had this ranked, right? So now that we've weighed all the things and we have our issues ranked, uh, now we need to manage our remediation, right? So we have our issues, now we need to manage it. I love this picture. This is, uh, I had to put this, this here. Uh, for those who can't see it, it's a fireman. He looks like he's talking to, to the media and a little caption under his name, it says, his name is Lieutenant Les McBurney. As soon as I saw this, I had to put this in slide. Anyway, this is this guy's gonna help us our manage our remediation. So how do we do this? We have a report full of bugs, uh, and now we gotta do something. So this is where I'm gonna take another analogy from something, so, someone <laughs> from another field, uh, and that field is chemistry. So in chemistry, dilution is the process of reducing the concentration of a solute in a solution usually simply by mixing with more solvent. So in our case, the solute is bugs, and the solvent is the code itself. So what we want to do is we want to add more solvent, and our solvent here is clean code. And so our concentration is going to be our, our number of bugs divided by the lines of code. This is really, uh, this is really important uh, for sort of understanding the level of uh, <clears throat> inaccessibility, say, of a, of a specific uh, document, say, is how, how many issues, how many, bad, how many, how bad are the issues in this code? Uh, that's going to give us an idea of, of a couple of things. One of those is going to be improvement. So here, uh, to continue my chemistry analogy, uh, we see here uh, three beakers that indicate different states of concentration, right? So given the three examples, we, are, we see our start point, our midpoint, and our end point represented by beakers of solution. And in our starting point, we see a beaker that has a high concentration of problems, especially high impact problems. So our, our high priority, medium priority, and low priority are indicated here by, uh, by dots. And the high priority issues are solid red, the medium priority have a hash mark through them, and, and low priority are um, are going to be the, uh, the the clear circles, basically. In our midpoint, we see that the vast majority of high priority problems have been eliminated, and this leaves us uh, uh, to address our medium priority problems. And finally, in our endpoint, we see almost all of our problems are low priority. We can choose to fix them if we'd like, and I believe that we should. And finally. By being on the second TPG or to use a, a unicorn, uh, this is our fully compliant system, right? We've gone through, we've iterated through these issues to the point where we've now got a fully compliant system. As if there is such a thing, but anyway, I like to think positively. So uh, we can actually use all of this to measure our improvement. 
right? So we can we can use this, uh, we can measure this uh, uh, by tracking it over time. Very simply, we measure our starting concentration minus our ending concentration, in other words, our improvement, and that's going to be divided by time. Now, there's an inherent flaw in this uh, simple approach in that it's most accurate when that time interval is a short one. And this, uh, this idea of a, a two-point representation for a first derivative such as this is going to be only first-order accurate, so it's really only useful for specific snapshots. Um, but another thing to keep in mind, too, is that the number of lines of code is going to change when the bugs are fixed. So you can't just continually count the bugs each time. You also have to count the, the, lines, of, the, the lines of code when we do our concentrations. So uh, in conclusion, uh, prioritization is going to help us to get uh, better more efficiently, more effectively. It's going to save us money. It's going to save us time. And ultimately, it's going to let us make bigger improvements for the user um, yeah, quicker. And so that's going to reduce our risk. And we have multiple factors that we can use to determine this priority. And we're going to iterate. Uh, on uh, these efforts to progressively dilute them. We don't have to come uh, full bore and fix everything all uh, at once. We can actually uh, do this iteratively uh, so that we can, um, we can also incorporate this into existing uh, processes. And then we can measure our success. So with that, uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. So Daniel's question was, uh, how much time does this process take in practice? Uh, yeah, one of the things that I, I didn't mention, uh, mostly because I didn't want to get stuck in the, in the mud uh, of trying to, to discuss this specific part, a lot of this, I think, is basically um, uh, is going to have to be determined ahead of time, right? Uh, it's going to be um, some of this stuff, some of this information based on the user impact and, and all that sort of stuff. You don't want to calculate that every time. Uh, so this is why I tend to like the best practice based approach to doing testing, even if it's with an automated tool or, or if it's in your manual test processes. Uh, I, I like the idea of doing some of this calculation stuff ahead of time. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be a problem uh, to try to do that. Uh, let's see here. Daniel also says, uh, at which point in the, let me scroll down. You guys don't mind if I maximize the chat, do you? So I can see. At which point in the testing process is the, are the weightings computed? Uh, so that sort of goes back into my, uh, my previous comment about uh, the best practices part. Uh, and that is the uh, determining some of that ahead of time is great because then you can go back through these th the issues themselves and do some of the stuff that's not predeterminable, like the volume of the issues and also possibly the location. Uh, Jonathan says, not sure if the IB and IV and I and so on and so forth covered this, but you mentioned a, char a chart that prioritizes prioritize accessibility bugs. Uh, I actually did that on a, a Excel worksheet. It's ugly. <laughs> um, so uh, unfortunately, I, I don't really feel comfortable sharing it because it's uh, not very user friendly. I just did it for myself and basically tossed it. Uh, uh, and so can you pre repeat how you got the concentration start and concentration end? So the concentration, remember, the number of bugs uh, di divided by the lines of code. So the concentration start is the number of bugs divided by by the lines of code when you uh, when you do the first round, and then the concentration end is is post remediation. So it would be like a uh, a regression audit would get you that concentration at the end. 
Uh, Jonathan says, <clears throat> is there anything like WCAG that you feel does a better job at prioritizing accessibility bugs? Uh, not really. Uh, I think the thing about, um, about WCAG, uh, especially the normative information about WCAG that's, that's beneficial, is that it is technology agnostic and, um, and so the success criteria themselves can be carved out into multiple best practices. Um, I would possibly look into things like the, uh, the UWEM, the Unified Web Evaluation Methodology. I don't know how mature that is. I know they were working on updating it as a result of WCAG 2. I don't know if they have. I've, I've been out of touch with that. And also the Accessi Web Standards in France may have some of that information, but I'm not really positive on that. Uh, so Daniel says, we're looking for a methodology to apply to an application fr framework, not just applications. Are there parameters you would add when scoring defects in an application framework? Yeah, I would. So uh, that's what's great about this is you can add up other things like the um, those secondary benefit things, right? Uh, because there are other, other uh, business concerns, right? So um, whatever concerns that, that may uh, impact changes to that framework might be a uh, might be beneficial uh, to consider as well. Now, Justin says, wouldn't any accessibility bug chart you created be different for each? For example, the chart for testing YouTube might be different than testing Gmail. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, that there are certain things that are always going to be the same. <clears throat> Excuse me, the same. Those would be those best practice related items <clears throat> themselves. So let's, let's make up a best practice on the fly. Uh, our best practice would be make sure that uh, all images have all attributes, right? So that's going to have some of those things, I guess, to, to use some, some sort of language like, uh, like the HTML spec would consider that stuff intrinsic, right? Some of these things like the user impact, ease and speed and repair, some of those things I discuss are sort of intrinsic to that specific best practice, right? So uh, um, uh, accessibility attribute, uh, ex all attributes for, for images is going to have really high impact for users who um, who uh, are blind or, or users who use uh, assistive technology like a screen reader or, or something like that. Not at all going to be uh, a high user impact for users with cognitive disabilities, unless, of course, they're, uh, I take that back because they may use screen readers too, uh, but maybe not motor impaired, right? So. Uh, sighted users who are motor, motor impaired may not be that impacted by all the attributes for an image if it's a decorative image. Uh, and the ease and speed of repair are super fast. So these are intrinsic to the, to the specific best practice. Uh, so the only parts that aren't intrinsic is the, is the, the specific uh, location of the issue um, uh, and the, uh, the, the volume of repeat issues. So those would be calculated when you log the bug, say. Uh, you could give those scores. As a matter of fact, um, I did run an experiment with some of this stuff using uh, Atlassian Bonfire. Uh, Atlassian Bonfire is a, is a companion application that's, uh, they've renamed it now, but anyway, it was a companion application for JIRA. And you can customize a lot of this stuff. You can add extra fields and stuff like that. And so we would have specific fields that were always populated uh, with, uh, with best practice information. And then we would add some of these other fa factors um, along the way. It was pretty interesting. I was a little unhappy with, uh, with um, Bonfire's inability to save all of that uh, project setup stuff across projects. But it was an interesting idea.
Anyone else? So David's uh, question was, what are your thoughts on crossover success criteria that helps lots of people? Uh, in this case, what I've found is that it's um, most beneficial to have these things be uh, very granular in nature um, because of the fact that there are, uh, so for instance, if we look at WCAG 1.1.1, you can, I've personally carved that out into somewhere on the order of 36 best practices. And those 36 best practices are extremely granular in nature because it helps me to calculate some of these things, some of these user impact things at that, at that very granular level um, uh, in a way that uh, I don't think is going to be terribly helpful if the best practice is overly broad. Um, All right, well, that's, uh, that's it, unless there's any other questions. Um, I personally want to thank everybody who's, who's uh, come along the way. I'm going to turn it over to Mike Pasiello, who can uh, say a few final words. But thank you all so much for having, uh, having the wherewithal to stick with us for so long and for uh, tweeting uh, and, and uh, helping the GAD hashtag and the ID24 hashtag uh, do so well on Twitter and for sharing information. So thank you all, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike now.